Eyewitness News presents Newsmakers with your host, Jane Ann Bugda and Andy Mahalchik. Hello and welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Jane Ann Bugda along with Andy Mahalchik. Today we are honoring the dedication and bravery of our area firefighters. We are talking with three area chiefs about the challenges they face every day protecting our communities. When we come back, we'll introduce you to our guests and our discussion will begin when this edition of Newsmakers returns right after this. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Jane Ann Bugda along with Andy Mahalshik. On duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it takes a special person with a lot of dedication to be a firefighter. And today we are hoping that you will support your local fire department and join us as we talk to the chiefs. Um, we are joined today, Andy and I, by three longtime firefighters, each chief, and we're going to talk to them a little bit about what it takes to protect our communities. We are joined by Chief Patrick DeSarno of the Scranton Fire Department, Chief Donald Leshko of the Hazleton Fire Department, and Chief Robert Leshko of the McAdoo Fire Department. Thank you all for being with us today. Welcome, guys. Thanks. Thanks. We thank you for your service. Thank and you. we want to, uh, you represent um, all the fire departments out in our area who uh, serve us every day. And we want to start off by um, each of you telling us a little bit about your departments. So, Chief Sasarno, we'll talk, start with you a little bit about the Scranton Fire Department. Okay, thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having us down here. Um, Scranton is a 24-7, 365 fully paid department, uh, 135 members, 129 of which are on what we call the suppression side. Then we have five, uh, our deputy chief, our administrative captain, we have our own fire inspection office as well, and we have a, one of our firefighters is, is assigned as a master mechanic. He, uh, we reinstated that recently under, under my tenure, for whatever you want to call it, uh, because our vehicles were just being, they were just going to pot because, you know, for, for, other, for many reasons, but um, we have six, seven stations. We have seven to eight apparatus, depending on um, our manning, um, five, en five engines, one or two ladder trucks, a rescue vehicle, and car 21, we call it, which is our command car, which the, these guys probably ride around in their command car. We have, he's a, that is assigned to our duty chief. He is the uh, shift leader. Uh, our, we have three platoons in Scranton. He is the uh, shift, uh, shift head, and um, he goes to response to every fire in Scranton. Uh, we help, we've also developed under these, um, these past few years a technical rescue team, which is available to all, all the counties, all of our surrounding communities. Uh, we have our own, um, um, we are the host community for Pennsylvania uh, Urban Search and Rescue Company 3, uh, which is uh, Pima, uh, Pima initiated team. If we get anything within this, within our state, we can, we have a team of members that go and run on that. And we've just uh, trying to develop a ha hazardous materials team, which is uh, going to be huge because we are, we have guys ready to go. And the closest one to these surrounding communities up here, up this way is um, Allentown or Lehigh Valley and Toby Haney Army Depot, which, uh, but it's really hard to get them off the base. And you are the third largest, correct? Thank you. Yeah, I, that and was going to be, yes. We, and because of our recent hiring, uh, we are now the third largest in the state, and that's counting the big boys, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Tell us a little bit about Hazel. Uh, the Hazel and Fire Department, we're a, um, we protect a, a city of about 24,000 population. We're a combination department, so we're taking, we have paid staff and uh, of 18 firefighters. There's uh, three duty chiefs, including myself, uh, meaning that uh, of the 18 guys, we work a four platoon system. Uh, they have, we have a constant in service at all times. We have uh, two engines and a truck company in service out of uh, three stations in our city. And in each chief, we also rotate shifts uh, throughout. So between myself and the two deputies, we rotate shifts to cover any incidents. Uh, we also have the unique aspect of having vol volunteer firefighters with us too in a combination department. So that means our paid staff works hand in hand with our volunteer staff. Uh, we roughly run an average of about a thousand responses a year. Uh, we do strictly fire, but we also do any public assist. Uh, assist. I, I pretty much say if somebody calls 911 calling for nobody else wants to do it, the, the fire department get call, calls and handles it. So we, uh, we again, uh, it's just a, um, we roughly about, I'm going to say an active is about close to 100 volunteers and, you know, roughly total of 300 because of support in the companies and all that. We have five companies uh, with the three stations and in apparatus wise, we do have uh, f a total of four engine companies, two truck companies, and in uh, a, uh, we have a trench rescue trailer 
a foam trailer and a, a utility support vehicle along with three chiefs vehicles that handle all of our incidents. And tell us a little bit about McAdoo. So the McAdoo Fire Company is a uh, all volunteer company. Um, we just recently completed a merger of three other companies which we now have merged the uh, McAdoo Fire Company, the Keystone Volunteer Fire Company and the Tresco Fire Company of Carbon County. We all have now recently merged into one uh, about a year now. Um, was a big undertaking um, in a volunteer company and uh, Presently, we probably do in anywhere between 75 to 125 calls a year, depending on where we go. Um, we also have, uh, again, all volunteers run by a uh, chief, some deputies, have about 45 volunteers who come out on regular calls. And then we also have a probably double that number when we do fundraising and other stuff um, of those people who come out and help us. Um, so it, it's, we do a lot of stuff for a small little volunteer company. Uh, but we're very proud uh, of what we do. And uh, we wanted to, we were setting this program up, wanted to get a good cross-section of a fully paid fire department like Scranton, a 50-50 uh, department, some volunteers, paid firefighters in Hazleton, with you know, about, about 75, 80,000 people in Scranton, no, not population. Not there, yes. 25, again, not right. really trusting the Census Bureau, but about <laughs> 25, 30,000. And Macu is a community of what, about 10,000? Uh, between Macu, Klein, Banks Township, it's about 10 to 12,000 people. And you're all volunteers, so we we'll get a good perspective of, of the challenges you face from each, each, uh, in each uh, segment. Yep. And you know, when you talk about a firefighter, you don't just go out there and fight the fire. There's a lot of training involved. Tell us a little bit about the training a firefighter has to go through before they even step foot on a scene. Would you like me to go? Yeah, sure, go, the up a go right bit. ahead. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll even chime in. I'll let the good looking chief go first. <laughs> go ahead, Bob. <laughs> Ask Bobby, go ahead, Bobby. <laughs> so so the, the sad part is, is in the state of Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania makes no requirement for you to be a firefighter. Mm -hmm. That is the disappointing part. Us as fire companies, departments, we make our own standards. So, so we believe that in order to put people out there, we want to make sure they're well trained and safe. So in, in my company, they need to have an essentials of firefighting, they need to have a hazardous materials, um, the a basic vehicle rescue type class, those kind of things, um, which we feel is important for what we cover. Um, we do add special added training and all that kind of stuff for our other apparatus. Um, so each individual company, how it goes, makes their own training standards. There is no magical thing out there in the state of Pennsylvania that says, this is what you need to be a firefighter. You know, one, I think you need that drive. You need to have that drive. Um, and I won't use fearless. I think fearless is a bad word, but, but you gotta be somewhat fearless in what you're doing, but you wanna be able to provide for your community. And whether you're being paid or a volunteer, you still wanna be able to provide for your community. And, and that's what you enjoy doing. And you gotta have heart to do it. And uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, like Chief Bob Lashko said, um, there, are, there is no standard to become a firefighter, an, an entrance level standard, like Police Have Act 120, you know, and then you could take that and go anywhere in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. but with, with the Scranton Fire Department, uh, we have a written, oral, physical agility, and um, psychological, criminal background, and a drug test before you even get into um, the, the, then you have to go to the academy and pass that, that was 13 weeks. And then if you pass that, then you get hired on our job. So it's all, getting, the hiring part is all contingent on getting all of that done before you even get put on the job. And and I, I always, always take both of the realms of both, what the both chiefs spoke about is on a volunteer side in the city, you join a company in the city, uh, basically you follow the same trace of training that uh, my brother spoke about. And then on the fire, on the career side, it's the same pretty much uh, trace of what Chief DeSarno talked about where we have to do the civil service testing. It's a, a, you know, a physical agility, uh, then a written, and then an oral interview process through psychological, medical, and you get hired. So, but but bottom line is the training. No matter if your career or volunteer is all the same. It's taught by the same people. And the bottom line is you need to have the train. In today's day and age, of what we deal with every day, you're not just dealing with the everyday common fire. You're dealing with the fire, the hazmat incident, the possible nat nat uh, nat natural emergency that you're going to deal with, flooding. Uh, you name it. Uh, in the fire service today, I think we're dealing with it. And you know, talk about the volunteer side. 
How are you seeing about the numbers of volunteers coming forward? We've done a lot of stories over the years. It's been challenging to get volunteers. What are you seeing in 2017? Uh, it, it is challenging. Uh, fortunately for us, we, we have a junior firefighter program uh, that we started. And, and, and the, the piece with that, though, is that will be the one part where I will say that the state has put a mandate on. If you are going to have juniors, you need to have officers or people who oversee them that have a child abuse clearance and a criminal background check. Um, we do criminal background checks on all our volunteers. Uh, unfortunately, it's the way of the world now. We just want to make sure. Um, but our junior program has, has increased a little bit. And I think it's because this friend sees this friend coming and all their friends from school want to go. But volunteerism is, is, is really on a decline. And, and some of it is because of, of financial reasons. People need to work two jobs. They need to work multiple jobs. There's multiple things with your family, trying to devote family time, volunteer time, everything else. Um, and the other thing is, is the sad part is, is, you know, people are being brought up. It's not about what can I do for my fellow person, but it's about what's in it for me. And, and people need to move away from the what's in it for me and, and understand the, the, the fulfillment that you would get from being out there just helping people. Uh, I think that's, that's one of the biggest things that I see happening in the volunteers, but it, but it is declining. Um, fortunately, I have people who still come out, you know, but uh, I hope there's not some day where it, that it's going to force small communities who have volunteers to have to go to paid departments and that the, the tax piece will be tremendous. It'll be tremendous on the taxpayer. Let, let me ask you, what are some of the biggest challenges you face as a department? Budget, budget, budget. Mm -hmm. budget. I mean, uh, yes, fun, funding is always a challenge. Uh, we have to find, you know, creative ways, avenues, grants, etc. There, there are things out there, some that we can grab that we have that we've we've taken full advantage of. In my tenure, I won't get into the past, but in my tenure, we've we've really gone hard after these avenues where where they're allowed. But funding's it has to be right across the board. Uh, we don't have any problems with recruitment, that's for sure, and uh, retention too. Once we get our guys on out, because we have a lot of federally funded mm -hmm. firefighters, so our big challenge in the next year or so is going to be uh, retention trying to keep those guys working. That's, that's our biggest uh, hurdle and our, our biggest goal, actually. And that's sad because that is such a, an important part of our communities, our protection of, you know, of, of the people who live there and our property. And, um, but besides money, what, is there, are there any other challenges you face day to day that you say, oh boy? I think it's the ever-changing demographics of our, of mm -hmm. our towns. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, years ago, everybody in our town, you knew everybody that lived on your street. You knew everybody that lived on the next block. You, you, we went to this store, you knew pretty much everybody. In today's world, you know, our, our, our areas have changed greatly. Uh, there's a lot of new influx of new residents. Um, there's a lot of the re older residents that have passed on. Uh, that, you know, I mean, I know some, some instance I've been on in the city where I've had to deal with some of our elderly population uh, one year and, you know, next year we're in the same block and, you know, talking to the neighbors, they said, oh, so-and-so passed away. So it's a changing demographics, it's a changing population that you have to adjust as a department to and work very hard to make sure that you're giving the most, be the most best quality service you can to your citizens. Let me ask you a question about the infrastructure. As we've all been around this in, in, in public service, whether it be uh, uh, broadcasting or public service uh, fire department, buildings are getting older, the infrastructure is getting older, so you're seeing more <coughs> water main breaks and even homes that are just not up to stuff to code, what kind of a challenge is it to work with the code officers or when you get to these places, fire alarms, smoke alarms, are you seeing that buildings being kept up? Uh, uh, personally, no. I think a lot of buildings go to deplorable conditions. Um, code officers are doing the best they can, but I also believe our lawmakers can do a lot more putting in sprinkler laws, a lot of that kind of stuff, because um, it is a proven fact, sprinklers do save lives. So you go and get sprinklers out there, making every home have a smoke detector, make every home have a carbon monoxide detector, and not only have them, but making them that they're working. Um, people go and install them, you know, they, they put them up and they don't care anymore. It becomes the end of it. Well, we're gonna take a quick break and when we come back, we're gonna continue our conversations with the chiefs information that you have today will be on pahomepage.com along with other information about other departments in our area. 
You're watching Newsmakers. We are a proud recipient of two Pennsylvania Association of Broadcasters Awards for excellence in public affairs programming. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Newsmakers. Jane Ann Bugda along with Andy Mahalchik, and we are chatting with the Chiefs. We are joined by uh, Scranton Fire Chief Pat DeSarno, Hazleton Fire Chief Don Leshko, and McAdoo Fire Chief Bob Leshko. Thank you all for being here today. And our, our conversation is about the challenges that you are facing, what you need to operate a department every day. And one of the um, changing times is now that I know the Scranton Department been trained to administer Narcan. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how that is ch the changing face of what firefighters do. Sure, you know, uh, it's it's almost sounds cliche to talk about the opioid epidemic, but it's real. It's out there. We see it every day. I'm sure you guys have seen mm -hmm. it every day. It's real. And a few months back, our, our sitting district district attorney Shane Scanlon approached us and offered us uh, naloxone kits and 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 the training that goes along with it, with, along with Pennsylvania Ambulance. And they came in. They uh, trained all of our firefighters in the administration of it. Uh, we're not a full-blown EMS department, like as you would say, as you would say, but um, we have. A nurse, we have five paramedics, we have 90 EMTs, and we have everybody now trained up to an EMR uh, standard. With that said, we have uh, kits on every one of our engines, and while, we, while we're not always going to be the first on scene for somebody in, with, in an op opioid seizure, uh, we might be, and uh, even so, we, we want to be ready just in case we might save a life. So th that was pretty awesome that uh, stepped up like that and get offered that to us. We gladly accepted it. And right now, Hazelton and McAdoo do not are not yet no. into that realm but that's probably down the line yeah and we we have an ems service in mcadoo so we run both out of our station so there's been talks mm -hmm. so and we were talking about the opioid uh epidemic you know the the creation of meth labs you know in in the olden days not that long ago it was in the middle of the woods somewhere mm -hmm. you never saw it until it exploded uh but now we're seeing it you know the other in, in the cities in the towns talk about that a little bit what challenges face if you're firefighters, especially when it comes to danger. We, we just dealt one with, uh, a matter of fact, uh, a few weeks ago we had one. On we had Grand one Street. On Grand, on Grand Street. We had an apartment yeah. building with a, a meth lab in it. And uh, you're dealing with a hazardous material incident. You're dealing with a, an incident that, in the size of a water bottle, can almost wipe out an entire building uh, mm -hmm. for what, what it's being made there. And, uh, you know, you're dealing with... You know, you really don't know what you're dealing with. I mean, the police got there, they, they suspected a meth lab. We got there with some metering equipment, found, yes, it was a meth lab. Uh, at that point, you know, immediately secured the scene, you know, secured, evacuated the building. And then you're dealing with, you know, with, between the, the state police um, through our city's police department. So you're dealing with a whole other, as I said before, you're not just dealing with fires anymore. You're dealing with a wide array of emergencies. And that's just one incident that we go on. Uh, that you know, it seems more and more too often that f area fire departments are dealing with that type of an incident. Do you find, um, are, are women involved in firefighting in each of your departments? We, we, we have some women in McAdoo who uh, are volunteers um, and, and they're very active, you know, they're active volunteers, um, get into it just as, as much as the, the guys do and, and uh, it, it's good to see it. It's, it's a equality, uh, everybody's there, we treat nobody different um, and they don't want to be treated different. Nobody wants to be treated different. So it's, it's, it's full force ahead with them. <laughs> In Scranton, we've had we have our second female on the department. I was I was uh, fortunate enough to have given her the chance to appoint her, but I, and I worked side by side with the first female on our department. And in the fire service, there are no and through the academy, there are no gender differences. It's all one standard, and if you can meet them, you can do the job. Then, then you can do the job, and I have no problem. She's awesome. Both of them were awesome. How physical can it be to be a firefighter? Yeah. How physical can it be? I mean, I see the bunker gear. We, we've again, we see you guys dressed. Your helmets are heavy. <laughs> and how physical physical is it? It, it? it takes a toll on you, you know. And I, I've always said when I when we took our firefighter one class, um, when I was done with that class that day, uh, I tell guys this all the time. I said that was in my eyes some of the most physically demanding class that I've ever taken to get that certification. And guys are doing it day in and day out. You know, but sometimes 
we're our own harm because you want to keep going, 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 where sometimes you've got to take that five minute break, you've got to take that 10 minute break, recharge your batteries and go because you're carrying, you know, you could be carrying 200 pounds of equipment on yourself alone, plus inside that heat and the physical activity that you're doing, you're going from zero to 60 in literally two seconds and, and, and you're going. And when you get to that high level, you're working, that high level of working could be hours. And, and that's where people need to, they just need to make sure they take care of themselves, know their physical limit, because it is very demanding. I think also a lot has to do is when you're out there, the demanding part of the job is the weather. You're dealing with uh, high, you know, heat and humidity in the summer. You're dealing with the cold. And we know in our area, especially in the wintertime, you deal with the cold quite often and, and you know you're dealing with a wide array of incidents between the cold uh, the strain not only putting all that equipment on but you have water freezing you, uh, the slip and fall become much more greater uh, so you're you know you've all that equipment on you you're trying to climb a ladder you're you know you're walking down the street your sidewalk or steps of a house that you know you just dumped you know a hundred thousand gallons of water on uh, it can make for definitely a treacherous situation. So between that and the summertime operations really puts a demanding toll on our firefighters. And thank, I think we're moving in the right direction. A lot of the emphasis, especially with us in Scranton now, is toward rehab. You know, 40, 30 minutes, 40 minutes at, on, at work, take a 10 minute break. We're forcing, our, we're making our guys do that. Back in the day, it was just go through five bottles until you drop yeah. and that's it. There was no rehab, no, no, wow. no relief, you know, and now the emphasis is on rehab. And I know we were talking before the show, um, and Annie and I remember when we were kids in Hazleton, they would sound the fire alarm and you would count it and you would go, you know, where the fire was in Hazleton. Well, nowadays we have the uh, social media, we have Facebook, we have Twitter. How has that changed firefighting in any way? <laughs> Y'all have Facebook I, I think, pages, I, I know I that. Think, I think it's, it's been a good thing, but it also is a bad thing because now as you know it's a good thing you're getting your word out there to the public you're getting the word out there you're getting your name you know you're getting the information to the public and that's what you want you want people to know what's going on but also sometimes i see in the fire service some of our firefighters think they're the hollywood producer <laughs> and they got to take the video because you got to get that great picture and that great video you remember you're there to do a job and i tell our guys that all the time and and i guess what i get grief for from people people will say you're being hard, but you are there to do a job. You're not there to be the Hollywood producer. You know, the news is being covered by professionals. Thank you. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what the news is being covered by. Our firefighters, and guess what? And a lot of the video that we see from firefighters that get on, they have the, the helmet cams. It's great training video, and it works out fantastic. But it's also the point is you got to remember you're doing your job and make sure the bottom line is also you're dealing with somebody's belongings. You're, you're in somebody's home. Mm -hmm. You want to have respect, and, and that's follow through. And it, it takes policies. You have you as a department have to set that policy. Unfortunately, we every department I think now has almost come up with a social media policy mm -hmm. because you have to do it. One, you want to act professional and you want to be professional out there, but you also have to take into consideration, as Donald said, you're in somebody's home. There is people there. You have to watch what you're doing. And you know when you're out at a fire, and I know one of the biggest fires we had in the area was the Sandone fire, uh, tire fire in Scranton, and it was huge. What do you want the public to do? I know once you know there's a fire, everybody's there, but they have to be respectful to your job. And a lot of times, how can the public help at a fire scene? <laughs> Stay away. Stay away. <laughs> uh, yeah. with, with being respectful to the public, you know, yeah. who, who we love and serve, but uh, to just steer clear, stay within, stay out on the outside of our. <laughs> there she blows. Uh -huh. Stay outside of our perimeters. You know, let us let us do our job. All of all of the firefighters that come in, let us do our job. Give us access. You know, give us room. Stay safe. You mm. use your heads. You know, just keep yourself safe as well. Because yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on at a fire scene that we're watching. And let alone we have to now pay attention to something like that. It's, it's not worth yeah. it. They, they put themselves and us at risk by doing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, we're, we're watching this video and that, and I'm thinking, you know, to myself, what type of plan should families have? They should definitely have a, first of all, number one, have a working smoke detector. Number two, have a working carbon monoxide detector. And number three, practice a plan and teach your children to get out, stay out, and also know to, to activate 911. And that 911 is not a toy. It's there to help you. It's there to bring you assistance. But the number one tools you can have, a working smoke detector and definitely a working carbon monoxide detector. And, and practice that stuff. That you would not believe, and, and there's videos out there all over the place of how many people have set smoke detectors off in their home and their children have not even woken up or moved.
So you, you need, that is something you should always try to practice and show that to your children that if you hear this, this is where you gotta go. It's not to be fearful, but it's just something that's there to early alert. It's almost like I use a comparison of how many cars have alarms on. And all of us have gone through parking lots or wherever or in the neighborhood and the car alarm's going off and you're automatically assuming it's no big deal. Right. It just, they hit the button or whatever. When in reality, someone could be breaking into it or be, you hit the panic button, they need help. So you've got to respond to it as if it is an emergency. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good point. And we have about two minutes left. I just want to ask you quickly, what, um, what's on the wish list for each of your departments? What would you like to have? Okay, I'll be quick. We, we mayor have Mayor Courtright, listen now. Okay. Well, the, the mayor has been awesome to He's the Scranton Fire Department. Yeah. He really has. And it's a whole new dynamic in Scranton now between labor and, and management. But with that said, our big wish list was our truck. We're getting a ladder truck in July, and through um, final capital, a capital project they, can, they committed to and grants, we were, we're getting that. However, we, we have those 22 uh, hazmat uh, certified guys, and we'd love to get a typed hazmat team. So if there's any big industries listening out there, we're not shy. <laughs> uh, in the city of Hazleton, we have a brand new pumper that's on order. Uh, that'll be here in August. We have uh, new chief cars coming, and I think, and the biggest thing is we have a great work. We're, we have great, we've been working great with the city administration and also our volunteer companies. So everybody works hand in hand together. I think apparatus is the wish list of everybody. You always wish you had something better. We have a FEMA grant that we're pending in McAdoo waiting on. But, you know, you never turn away a volunteer. You'd always wish you had more people. And whether it be fighting fire or doing something else, doesn't matter. We'll find a job for you. <laughs> well, we want to thank you. We have less than a minute left, and I want to thank all of you for your service and for your dedication to our communities and keeping us safe. We have information on today's show on pahomepage.com. We're under the Newsmakers link. We have other stories on there about other fire departments, about the fire departments today, and about being a volunteer. For Andy Mahosik and everyone behind Thanks, the guys. scenes, thank you. I'm Jane Ann Bugda. Thank you for making Newsmakers part of your day. We invite you to support your local fire department, and thank you for joining us. <laughs>